Hi, this is Miss Linton, and this is my wonderful, excellent, well-rested here at the wrong time period, period four class. Say hi. Hi. All right, and we're going to continue on chapter 27, and we're going to discuss evidence of evolution. So I have little pictures up here, and all of these are pieces of evidence for evolution. Try without looking at your notes. Try not to look. I know, bad. Look, don't look at your notes. See if you and your bio buddy can come up. What do you think each of these represent as pieces of evidence for evolution? Go ahead. Have that. The Watching the twins, and do you remember when we talk about behavior and we talk about nature versus nurture? Yeah. And what do we say? Is your some of your behavior and your what? Your DNA, yeah. right? I'm watching both of them go like this with their hair. Exactly. <laughs> I'm all. This is kind of cute. Okay, sorry. Come back to me. Let's start with DNA. Do you think DNA is a piece of evidence? Yeah. yeah. What would you say? The more similar the the. What are we talking about again? DNA. DNA. The more similar the DNA, DNA the more closely related. related. There you go. That is the first piece of this. This one right here, biochemical evidence. Biochemical evidence. This is the biggest piece of evidence right now. Not only do you compare DNA, but you compare things that DNA codes for. What is the DNA code for? Protein. Good. So you can compare, and what are proteins made out of? Yeah. Amino acids. So you could have something like, let me, let me take you back, back, back in time. Cellular respiration. What was the first step? Glycolysis. Glycolysis. Who does it? Also. Also. Where do they do it? In the cytoplasm. What's the second step? Transition, Transition prep. prep. What's the third step? Krebs cycle. Remember? Two, no. twelve. Is six, six do the bit, get it? Okay. Five, then you gather all the reduced NADs and FADs and take them to the top of the ETC. Uh uh. Na 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 na. Reductase, reductase, cytochrome oxidase. Now, that is occurring in mighty mitochondria, yeah? You can take proteins along your na 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 na, along your electron transport chain, and you can compare them and you look to see how similar are those proteins. Who coded for those proteins, right? The DNA. So you can make comparisons around like universal organelles. Um, and so we're gonna look at that part. That's biochemical evidence. What's this right here? Fossils. fossils, okay? So you're looking at fossils over time, right? And looking to see how they might have changed. And if you look at the fossil record, it goes from simple to more complex over time, and we'll talk about that. This right side is going to drive me nuts, but this upgraded notebook, it smishes my boxes even after I fix them, so I can't handle that. Do you see that word? Biogeographical. Okay, I'm going to put it away there. <laughs> so, biogeographical evidence, what is there a picture of on that? Pangea. Okay, so what do we know? What kind of evidence could support evolution, change over time? What kind of evidence could Pangea and studying that show? Any ideas? Yeah. Uh, when two continents separated, one species evolved differently than the other species. Good one. That's like the key one I would use. Because by the time the continents separated, the continents were separating about 65 million years ago, and that's when mammals were really making a run for it. And so that's why you have real different mammals, specialized mammals on each continent. And that would show you that they adapted to their particular environment. Any other evidence there on Pinch? Yes. Is there a like, tropical thing on Antarctica? Like, Trop like, they used to be like that. Exactly. So that tells you that organisms w adapted, right, to that particular climate at that time. It was warm. Now, before evolution was even discussed, what would people say how things came about? What would be the word you would use? It starts with a C. Creationism. Right? And it's okay, we've had this discussion, right? 
It's okay for you to, to absolutely have your faith in that. Remember, we're taking God out of the picture in order to explain this. So creationism, the idea was fixity of species, that God created each and every organism right where it is, and it, and it became that. So the argument would be, why would God make an amphibian or reptile in Antarctica if it couldn't survive there, right? And then it died and then got covered with ice. Or could it have evolved when Antarctica was in a warmer area on the region on the Earth, okay? What else, anything else? Yeah. Um, also, um, in like for example, they found a species of animal that was found both in Africa and South America. So there's like no way that it could have like the animal Exactly. I agree with Cameron 100%. So that is all biogeographical evidence. Any clue on this next one? Yes. There we go. So this is, look at that tan box. Anatomical, I'm going to go right there. Anatomical evidence, and one of those is homologous structures. So when you look at, hold out your arm up here, what you would call like your funny bone if you hit it, and it's not funny if you've ever really hit it hard. It's seriously not funny. Okay, so um, that's your humerus. Then coming up from your thumb is your radius. Next to that is your ulna, right? And then here around your wrist area, these are your carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Okay, so that's our bone structure. But if you look at a sloth or a horse or a bird or a bat, they too have humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals. But for a bat, it's phalanges. And those phalanges extend out really long and are part of their wings. So when you look at that anatomy, those conserved structures through all of those different organisms, which all happen to be mammals, by the way, okay, you would think, well, if you have common structures, who codes for our structures are what? Yeah. DNA. So if we have common structures, we must have common <coughs> DNA and we must have a common yeah. ancestor. So that's another piece of evidence. There's other anatomical evidence as well. Um, vestigial structures. Vestigial structures are structures that could have been useful to us in our ancestral past, but are not useful to us now. And, and that would show change over time. For instance, if you have a salamander who lives in a dark, dark cave, and they don't have eyes, they have like withered eyes, like withered eye foldy sockets where eyes would be, okay, or partial eyes. Now, do you think God created them in that cave with withered eyes? What would be the point of God creating them with withered eyes? What might have happened? They could have lived out where there is sun and moved eventually into a cave, and then those eyes became less important for survival, and so it didn't matter if you had eyes or didn't have eyes, you were still living, so over time those eyes became less and less. Think about wings. Who tends to have wings? Birds, right? Now, think about a penguin. Does a penguin have wings? Yeah, is he flying? No, what is he using them for? Yeah, so he's using them for an alternative purpose and they're not built to hold weight of any type. He uses them for swimming. So did God make him a bird with little withered wings? Or could he have adapted those wings over time due to his environment in order to survive in that water. Now, I don't think he can sit there and will his wings like, be more like fins, okay? He can't do that. But those birds who could, if most of their food source was in the water, those birds who could swim a little bit, those are the ones that survived and reproduced. And the next ones could swim a little more. And the next ones could swim a little more because you kept selecting for those birds that could use their wings for swimming instead of flying. Think about an ostrich. Does an ostrich have wings? Yes. Does he use them for flying? No. no. He's not getting his butt off the ground with those things. Because over time, it became more valuable to have strong legs instead of wings that could fly for his environment that he lived in. That's anatomical evidence. And there's a third piece of anatomical evidence called this, oh, did I just talk about this, did you? Yes, embryological structures. And embryological structures would be things that you would see in a embryo, right? And when you compare embryos of different organisms, the idea would be the more similar the embryo development, the more what? Closely related. And not only that, when you look at those embryos, it's kind of like you're looking at evolution on fast forward. 
For instance, you, during your embryological development, you have gills at one point during your development. And at one point, you have a tail. tail. You still have a tail what? Bone, right? Um, so that would be an example of ev evidence that's anatomical. Okay, and the last one, do you know what this is right here? Any clue? Yeah. Isn't it kind of like the ages of life? It is the ages of life. It's dating and the geological time scale. Okay, and um, you can, again, we'll look at different eras and what kind of life forms you see in each of those eras. Okay, now I've just given you a tiny little introduction we're gonna flesh it out a little bit more on specific points as I go through this. But right now I'm thinking of a number between one and 10. So pick a number and tell your bio buddy. I was going to. Are you ready for my number? Whoever's closest wins and whoever wins, pass or play, I'm going, hey, give me some evidence for evolution and go ahead and spout off minimally about each of those, or you can assign part of them, however you want to do it, winner. You ready? My number was one. Keep going. I'm talking Chloe. Yeah, I did. Super cute and non then It's non washed because it had keratin, so you can't wash it. That's like it was day two. What? I don't think she cut any off, but it's just so. Uh, I haven't washed it in two days. Did you say hashtag yeah. super cute? No, I said super cute and non That's what I said. <laughs> All right. So, you probably have the basics now where you could explain this. Let's talk about it a little bit more. We're going to start with those fossils. If you said, I want to be a fossil too, you have to be 10,000 years old to be a fossil. Okay, 10,000 years old to be classified as a fossil. And look at your definition of what a fossil is, because Slate, please give the definition of a fossil. Go ahead. Okay, then you can take care of line number two. You must be how old? 10,000 years old. To be a fossil. And there are many different types of fossils, so I'm just going to touch on a few. You know this one right here, amber, right? Could a woolly mammoth be found in amber? No. No, why not? Because yeah, they don't trees. Yeah, they don't get stuck in trees, and also they're quite large, okay? So they're not going to be like, oh, you know, I'm stuck to the amber, okay? It, it's that, the sap isn't going to hold them, but you can find insects in, ambers, in amber. Where you could find a woolly mammoth, though, is preserved in ice. And they have found, like, whole woolly mammoths in ice before, and so much so that one guy even cooked and ate part of that woolly mammoth, okay? And that tissue is frozen like if you put a steak in the freezer, and so they can defrost it and actually study it and look at the DNA of it, look at the hair that's on it, and analyze that um, for the conditions on the earth, you know, the earth when it was living. So woolly mammoth you might find in ice. Um, you've heard of petrified wood and where that wood is turning um, to minerals. There are things like petrified salmon. That looks like, you know, a really scary salmon because he looks like he has some teeth there. There are things called molds and casts. And let me just explain that. Let's say I had a clam and I had soil, like sedimentary rock, get buried in like a body of water. And then the clam broke down, disintegrated. I have this outline. It would be called the mold. If some other soil filled in that mold, the shape of that mold, that would be the cap. So for instance, you could have a jello mold, right? So that would be the outline, the jello would be the cap. Okay? And at this point, I'm gonna start to pass around a few fossils that belong to me. Um, 
when my mom was alive, we had a ranch up in Pass Robles, and then my uncle Richard and Aunt Nelson, before they moved, had a ranch in Shandon, and people would go there all the time to get fossils. And so these are just a couple of them, okay? And um, these, maybe a mold, maybe a cast, we take a look at it and see if we can figure it out. And the way we're gonna do this is I'm gonna go down and then up and then down and then we'll have you girls hang on to everything, okay? And then um, this one, this is a weird one, okay? This one, they they found a um, like part of a whale skeleton, and um, this would be part of the phalange portion of it, and this would be like a joint, like right up in here. Can you see the demarcation right here? And then the fossil, fossil it kind of looks like a bone right here. So anyway, like kill somebody with this. But don't drop it on your computer. Um, this one I bought at a store. <laughs> Okay, and this one I also bought at a store and someone broke it and it's a trilobite and that makes me super sad. So be careful when you pass these around. And then also this one I bought at a store, it's a little tiny trilobite. And that's gonna become, I'm gonna show you some things later so you can pass those around. Okay. All right. Um, here's another one. Not only can it be like that creature preserved, but it could be footprints or wormholes, you know, that are also considered fo um, fossils. And if you have an imprint, what would that kind of be like? A what? Like what I just talked to you about. Not the mold, but, oh yeah, yeah, no, 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 the cat, the, the mold. It would be like the mold, yeah, like what you said the first time, okay? Um, you tend to find rocks like those um, shells that you see, those seashells and the whales. Those were found in Pass Robles and Shandon. If you know where Pass Robles and Shandon are, are they on the coast? No, they're inland. So what does that tell you about Pass Robles and Shandon? Used to be underwater. That would be good evidence for geologic evolution, right? So the geology changing over time. And you can find a lot of good fossils in these sedimentary rock layers. How are these sediments, when you drive, like if you go out to Mammoth and you see those sedimentary rock layers, those huge formations, you know, when the free, do you know what I'm talking about? And some of them are red, like iron in them and different things. Uh, when you go see those, you need to realize that at that area, that was more than likely all underwater. And these sediments came from runoff, bringing down minerals from some rocks up in some mountain that are, are weathering away, and then creating these different layers that are compressed over time. And this is a good place to find fossils because this would be about relative dating. Because whatever's on the lower layers is assumed to be what? Older, Older and whatever's on the top layers are younger. <coughs> okay, and here's another one. This is a bulldog fish. Look at how many people it takes to hold up this fossilized bulldog fish, very large. Um, and the characteristics of the fossil record are that the earlier organisms that they're finding are simple and that um, you see a gradual transition in time. Okay, and now I want all the fossils just to hold still for a second so I can get your attention, undivided attention up here, okay? The process of fossilization, I want you to think about it for a moment. To become a fossil, what is more likely to get fossilized? A hard body part or a soft body part? Hard. hard, okay? So it has to be a hard body part, and then it has to be in the rare conditions that would preserve it to make it a fossil, right? Okay, because a lot of times if something's eating it, they're totally destroying it, it's going through a digestive system, or you know you could have volcanoes that are destroying that area or whatever. So first of all, it has to be a hard body part, and then it actually has to get fossilized. And then on top of that, it has to be found by a human. And then we call it a fossil. And think about when they're like building these buildings sometimes, and you'll hear like, oh, they're digging up something and they're finding like an ancient you know, Indian burial ground that's maybe 600 years old, right? And that's like, wow, oh my gosh, it's here. And they happen to stumble across it. How old are the things that are fossilized? 10,000 years old. Okay, we don't even see, find all the things that are five and 600 years old. We discover things that are 300 years old, like, oh my gosh, what a find. Okay, 
Fossils are 10,000 years old. So it has to be something that can be fossilized. It becomes fossilized. It doesn't end up getting destroyed by any geologic movements and a human finds it. Those are the fossils we have. But from all of the accumulation of fossils that have been found, you see this where earlier organisms, those found in lower layers, are simple and they become more complex and you can see this gradual transition in form. And the best one to look at that's a little bit more modern because it's a mammal, so it's like in the last 65 million years, right? Okay, is um, the horse, evolution of the horse. And as little as 50 million years ago, it was more like the small size of a dog. And its environment at the time was like in a forest. So it'd be like hopping, skipping around and hiding in the forest, you know, and trying not to get eaten. But remember, our continents are doing what? Shifting. Shifting. And when they shift, what else changes? The climate. So their forested environment stopped being foresty, and there wasn't, remember I said these leaves of fossils? And stopped being foresty, and it started to be drier, so it couldn't hold, it couldn't rain enough to support trees, but it could like a grassland. So now, over the millions of years, it's more like a grassland. And now it's not a good idea to be like the size of a dog, because you can't always hide in the grass, it's not always long enough to hide you, and it would be easier for something to eat you and to become prey. So the horse that survived are the ones that were a little bit what? Bigger. So you would have like um, a generation of them, let's say, and some of them are taller, some of them are average, and some of them are shorter. Of all those offspring, the ones that survived were the ones that were taller. And then in the next go around, of all the ones that survived enough to reproduce, they were the taller ones. This is called directional selection, when you select for a feature, and so they got bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And what I just gave you was natural selection. And though Darwin didn't coin this phrase, you've heard of this, survival of the fittest. A man named Wallace did that when he was almost dying, um, and so he thought, uh, survival of the fittest, am I gonna make it? And then, then you have natural selection, which is then um, a mechanism for evolution, for change over time, right? So um, you can keep moving your fossils again. Um, and then um, how fast it happens, it could be a very brief change or it could be a longer change. And brief in geologic terms is one million years. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this um, later, but I'm going to show it to you now. This is called punctuated equilibrium when it happens really rapidly. And the way I remember that, in punctuated equilibrium, I hear this word, though it's not exactly right, I hear this word. What is this word? Punch. punch. And if you were going to punch somebody, you would want to punch them very quickly. Yeah. And hard. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're all hard. Okay. Go with my idea here. Punch fast. So punctuated equilibrium is when it happens very rapidly. There's, a, conversely, on the other extreme, is gradualism, where it would happen very slowly. Gradually. Yeah, gradually. Where do you think you're going to find more transitional forms? When it's quick or when it's slow? Where will you find more transition? When it's slow. Yeah, because there will be a lot of evidence. Um, so if you look here, this is probably the most... Um, commonly known transitional form, and that's the Archaeopteryx, where it's that transition between a reptile and a what? Bird. Okay? And so that would be a transitional fossil. And like I said before, here's an idea. It, this says gradualism. This says punctuated equilibrium. Whoever is the youngest bio buddy, can you differentiate between those two? Go ahead. Okay, so in which of these would you find more transitional forms? Gradualism, because it's going to leave a lot behind. Okay, this way, and we'll write notes about that part in a little bit. So on your notes, um, we already said must be at least 10,000 years old. Transitional fossils resemble two groups that are currently classified separately. Oftentimes represent the intermediate. Oftentimes represent the intermediate. 
And then I said, think Archaeopteryx, birds, and dinosaurs. All right, and then when you look um, at the geologic time scale, and I'm going to introduce it now, and I'm going to introduce it in a minute, okay? If you look right here, the eras that we are, the era that we're in right now is the Cenozoic. Then the middle one in the middle is the Mesozoic, Mesozoic in the middle. Then Old and Paleozoic. And then before that is called Precambrian. And we'll talk more about that later, but what I want you to see are these mass extinctions that take place. In some cases, 90% of the life forms were made extinct. And when you see that, where there are mass extinctions, all of a sudden you're creating a lot of vacancy. And you might see a whole bunch of new species come about, and then not all of them maybe are the best adapted. It's just because there's so many vacancies, you see a bunch of them at that time, because there's less what? competition. And then you'll see those numbers pruned back and usually the ones that are best adapted to that environment tend to survive. And a little bit later in this unit you're going to do something more about mass extinctions. I just want to introduce it now <coughs> and there are five major mass extinctions where a lot of life was wiped out. Um, and then we talked a little bit about this already, relative dating and absolute dating. Could my oldest bio buddy Try to think about what we discussed in our last talk about these two things. Go ahead. Okay, so relative dating, you're just saying, okay, these rocks that are lower are older, so whatever's down in these older rock layers, and then these are newer fossils up here on top. And then do you remember the trilobite, the one that was broken I told you I sat about, and then that little tiny one you saw was a trilobite? Trilobites don't exist now. But again and again and again, through absolute dating, they're figuring out these are, you know, somewhere if you look 520 to 545 million years ago, that's when you find trilobites. And that's consistently happens. So trilobites are known as an index fossil. Because if you find a layer that has trilobites in it, you know anything below that layer, you would assume would be what? Younger or older? Older. older. So it must be older than you know 530 million years old right and any layer found above it must be younger and so that's also part of um, relative dating is you say oh it's before the trilobites or it's after the trilobites that helps give you kind of a benchmark absolute dating we've already talked about this before and we were talking about isotopes and how quickly they break down and scientists know how rapidly they break down. So when they have a sample of rock, they can see, oh, how much of it is left, and then this is how old that rock is. So between both of those, they came up with the geologic time scale. So um, we also, when we talked about the supercontinents, one of the pieces of evidence about that is that you have rock layers that match between two different continents. So did that happen magically? Did God create them with dead fossils in there that exactly match? Or is it possible all the continents in that area were together, they lived there, they died there, they got covered by sedimentary rock, and then those continents diverged with all those fossils inside of them. Okay. So that would be the next piece on your notes. Go to where it says geologic, um, oh sorry, dating. Relative is you're looking at um, the order of events using sedimentary rock layers. Looking at the order of events using sedimentary rock layers. And absolute dating is the actual age of the event. Yes? Um, is this what happened at Stonehenge? Or no? I, what, are some of the, what are some of the hypotheses about what happened at Stonehenge? 
Any ideas about that? Yes, I've heard things like it was a calendar, a way of dating, um, um, of keeping time. And you wonder how did those rocks get put up in that exact pattern? And then isn't there like a mini Stonehenge looking like thing somewhere else? Or is it bigger than? I remember I watched something on it. So what do you mean, do you think this is what happened? I think those rocks were, were placed there. Like, yeah. yeah, probably, you know, I would go with the humans placed in there. Are there extraterrestrial landing sites? I don't know. How many of you have been to Stonehenge? It, it's pretty cool. You stand in the middle of it, and you're just like, how did they get here? I don't know. There's but I think, that in like Sweden, so yeah, there's, there's like something that mimics it. it. So yeah. Weird. Now, what were you asking me about Stonehenge? Though? If it like happened over time, like layers, I don't know what the rocks really look like. I think those rocks were somehow put there by a lot of people working together. <laughs> yes. Well, have you heard that like the, on Easter Island when they yes. asked like natives how did you get there, they said they walked and people laughed at them. But recently, they did an experiment where they actually made them walk, and they're like, so they were not telling us a lie. Yeah, exactly. And where where they, but that's where they put the sticks kind of underneath them, and they move them. Or when you talk about rocks moving due, due to no, the, um, um, environmental conditions, the people like put ropes. Yes, I watched that. Yeah, that yeah, cool. So they're thinking that that's what they did for Stonehenge. Stonehenge too. Yeah. Um, Okay, and that looks like a question, but it, it, in the upgrade, it should transition over. So, and not it. Not it. Whoever is not it, pass or play, give a little review of Carbon Decay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I can't remember those are all so a billion So is it is it um do they think it's a calendar? I know some people think it's because ten, ten, or a combination calendar, yeah, right? Oh no, there's okay. a hundred hundreds is not some people think it's aliens. Yeah. <laughs> Which you know, you never know, right? So okay, Sam found the other one I was talking about. What is it called, Sam? Um, Calineus. If you Google it, you can see it. The Calineus standing. It's C-A-L-A-N-A-I-S. And so she, they say some people think it's a calendar, some people think it's a temple. It might be a calendar temple, or it might be aliens. We're open to that. Okay, um, moving on, let's take a look at um, this geologic time scale. And I'm gonna introduce it to you in just a minute. I'm gonna make a strong suggestion. Whoever is flip a pick, because this is obviously too small for us to discuss. Whoever is flip a pick, find a good geologic time scale. It doesn't have to be that one. Okay, but hear me, this is the qualifications you're gonna want. You're gonna wanna see the eras and you're gonna to wanna to see the evolution of plant life and the evolution of animal life as diagrams. Okay, you wanna see the eras. You don't have to see the periods. It can be a little bit helpful though if the periods are on there too. Usually they have the periods. Plant life, animal life. And you may not want to put it in the column where it's small. You may wanna put it like below our last or above these notes might be a good place to put it. Um, right above where these notes start. Put it in that so it can go across your whole page. So flip a pick, find a one. Flip a pick in there. That's good if you did. But that never happened. Yeah, me either. I came to finish my you scared? A little nervous? You'll be great. I have no doubts in you, my dear. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Okay, does everybody have a geological time scale? Yes. Okay. No, don't put it at the bottom. She said to. No, she said put it anywhere. That it's I put it like above these where these notes start. Like I would put it. Uh, I put it above twenty-seven point one. That's where I'd put it. Put it above twenty-seven point one. Okay. Everybody have one because I want to get your full attention because I want to teach it to you and I and you'll remember it forever. Okay. And I'll teach it to you in, in like two steps, okay? So this is the first step, just learning the years and the name, okay? So come to me, look to me. Close your Chromebooks if you need to, if they distract you, but just look up, okay? So the era we're in right now, the center of your world, the center of the world, the era you're in right now is the Cenozoic. What are a lot of you doing this year, learning how to drive? drive. What is the speed limit? On the freeway. The Cenozoic era is now, 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 this second, no, this second, no, this second, this second. Back how many millions of years? 65 million years. Okay, 65 million years ago, that's when the Cenozoic era started. When did the Cenozoic era end? Now. Oh, now, 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 now. Okay, so it's still going on. Okay, now back to 65 million years ago is the Cenozoic. The next era back is in the middle, it's called the Mesozoic Era. Now the Mesozoic Era ended 65 million years ago, right? Because then it became the Cenozoic Era. But when did the Mesozoic Era start? About the time school gets out. Look, look on your group shared notes now. 248, okay? So, 240, and you will get, depending on which one you put in there, there's all kind of variations in there. So somewhere around 240, so it's after 230, okay? School's out, okay? It's about the time the Mesozoic era started. Now, before the Mesozoic era was the old and pale, what era? Paleozoic. What time did it start? About dinner time. Look at your clock, what does it say? 542. 542. So that's when dinner, that's dinner time, right? So if you can remember, drive your car, think that's when what era started? 65 million years ago, that's the Cenozoic. Mesozoic in the middle, you wanna think school is? 248. Yeah, 248, school's out, right? And then the old and Paleozoic time, that's about the time you eat dinner, around 540 something, okay? Is dinner time. Okay, everything before Old and Paleozoic is called what? Pre-Cambrian. That's going to go all the way back to the beginnings of Earth. When did the Earth start? Yeah, so Pre-Cambrian goes from 4.6 billion years ago up to the start of the Paleozoic era, which is about what? 542 million years ago. It's a big span of time. Now, I'll teach you how to know the organisms in there too in just a minute. You'll know them, but shh, no problem, okay? You don't have to memorize all of them. You just have to remember the book is, like on either, on either side. Now, I want to show you for perspective. Take a look here. This is your taking all the history of the Earth and putting it in a 24-hour clock. Now, when did this day start? This day that we are living right now, Thursday. When did Thursday start? 12 o'clock midnight. 12 o'clock midnight, last night. Were you awake or were you asleep? Asleep. Good job. What did I tell you about sleeping more? You need seven to nine. Yeah, you need seven to nine hours. Are you getting it? I did not. The night before I got to bed on time, last night, not, okay? So, I was not. I was making the phylogenetic tree puzzle. <laughs> Because I also made it for Miss Stutz and she needs it on Friday, so I had to make it. I don't need it till Monday. Okay, so come back to me. So, if we look at um, the whole history of the Earth and put it on a 24-hour clock, last night, midnight, is when the Earth started. And I want you to look, formation of the Earth, and that was about how many billions of years ago? 4.6, eyes up here, please. Formation of the Earth, oldest known rocks, and what time period are we in? Pre-Cambrian. Oldest fossils. How old did we say the oldest fossil was? 
3.6 billion years ago. So how much time passed between when the Earth started and we had our first life form? One billion years, approximately, right? Okay, so oldest fossils, and those oldest fossils were what kind of cells? Prokaryotes. First photosynthetic organisms, we're still in Precambrian. It's eight in the morning, and we're still in Precambrian. When did Precambrian start? Midnight. It's eight in the morning, we're still in Precambrian. Let's keep going. Free oxygen in the atmosphere, that was around two billion years ago, in that range. We're still in the Precambrian. Oldest, what kind of fossils? Eukaryotic. We're still in the Precambrian. It's six at night, and we're still in the Precambrian. So midnight last night, six tonight, you're still in Precambrian. Oldest multicellular fossils, it's eight or nine o'clock at night, and we're still in Precambrian. Paleozoic era and land plants didn't start until about 10 p.m. Then we're in Mesozoic era, age of dinosaurs. Then Cenozoic, the era we're in right now, it wasn't until the last 30 seconds of a 24 hour clock before you start to see humans. If you like thought of an orange as the Earth's time, it's like the oil on the skin of the orange is where you're finding humans. <coughs> not even on the skin. The skin is like the paleo mesozoic era, right? So in almost the only recent, recent times do you find any human um, remains, so in the last 30 seconds. So the bulk of time, this is all Precambrian, 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 right? Now, looking at, look, do you see where it says on your notes, it says geologic time scales and Precambrian, and I gave you the years right there. So we're gonna talk about what kind of things happen during that massive amounts of time. Look at this from bottom to top, ping pong back and forth, just say what happens. Go back and forth, Slate, you start with this one, and I'll talk to you about the top one. Go ahead. Okay, so four point six billion years ago, the Earth was Uh, 2.7 billion years ago, there was a lot of Protozoan Good luck. Adia Kara. Adia Kara. Adia Kara. Adia Kara. Adia Kara. Adia Kara. Adia this hurts my so much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so look at this. So we have the Earth, then we have fossils in the threes, oxygen revolution in the twos, then eukaryotes, then protists. We know about protista, right? And you get to the point where you have this, this Edicarium fossils, this right here, that's just a location where they found a bunch of fossils. But you have invertebrates, Invertebrates, what does it mean to be an invertebrate? No spine. Yeah, no spine. So you have invertebrates, small flat creatures, and plants-wise, you have algae. That's as far as you get in um, Precambrian. And why is this called Precambrian? What's on the other side of this line? What era would be next? This is Precambrian, then what, what's the next era you would have? Paleozoic. Paleozoic, right? The first period, like, each of the eras are broken down into periods. The first period of the Paleozoic era is called the Cambrian period. So that's why everything before this is called what? Pre-Cambrian. Pre that's where that came from, okay? And so up into this point, you end up with algae and you end up with invertebrates. If you look here, these are some of the fossilized remains of these soft-bodied invertebrates that they date as far back. When did the Cambrian period start? 542. Yeah, 542, because it was the first period of the Paleozoic era. So that's where they're finding these um, very early invertebrates. So if this, we transition into the Paleozoic era, thank goodness there was an artist that was alive then, because they didn't have cameras, but they could at least draw it. Okay, so these would be some of the creatures that you might see as we transition into the Paleozoic era. So on our notes, I want us to write 
where it says Precambrian, put first cells. So during that time, you got your first cells and you went up to invertebrates and algae. First cells, and then you could draw an arrow or just put first cells to invertebrates and algae. Okay, now get this right now. If I tell you, first cells to invertebrates and algae, okay, look at me so I can see the whites of your eyes. If you're ending the, the um, Precambrian at invertebrates and algae, then that's where you're starting in the what era? Paleozoic era. So I don't need to rewrite that, right? Wherever I end the last era, that's where I'm starting for the next one. So we don't need to go starting with invertebrates and algae, right? We don't need to do that. We're just going to learn the bookends, and then we'll know what happened in between that. So I want to talk to you more about this Paleozoic era. These are some maybe like what you would see. It's very cool sunglasses. Okay. But overall, this is where you ended. You went from algae all the way up to gymnosperms. What's a gymnosperm? It's a Christmas tree or a Hanukkah bush. These are tall uh, trees with needle-like leaves, those types of plants, okay? So you're going from algae up to gymnosperms, and you're going from these invertebrates all the way up <laughs> You're going from invertebrates all the way up to the beginnings of reptiles. So when we look, if we're going to go from invertebrates to reptiles, what might we hit along the way? We go from invertebrates, somewhere in here we're going to have to hit what? Vertebrates. We're going to get fish. What else are we going to get? Amphibians, right? And then we're going to get reptiles. So we don't need to list all of this off. As long as we know we go from invertebrates to reptiles, you kind of have a perspective. Is that a lot of evolution? Yes. That's a lot of evolution, okay? And you're going from algae, totally dependent on water, and you're going through the whole evolution of plants, which you don't need to learn about, but, I mean, you can on your own free time. I'm not holding you accountable for it. But you've got to get onto land. You've got to withstand the drying conditions of Earth. You've got to evolve xylem and phloem. You've got to evolve um, roots. Um, you have to evolve seeds. Those are all giant plant evolutionary steps. All I need you to know is in the Paleozoic era, you went from algae to gymnosperms. Okay, that's what we're going to need to write down. So on your notes, I wrote up to gymnosperms and early reptiles. Up to gymnosperms and early reptiles. Okay, now this became a big deal, and Blue just wants to talk to you about it. Go ahead, Blue. Go ahead. Okay, now, I want you to use your large mammalian brain to think about something. What comes after gymnosperms? Do you know what they call plants that have flowers? Starts with an A. Have you heard this before? Angiosperms. Have you heard that? Yeah. Angiosperms are flowering plants. What? How do flowers have sex to make babies? Pollen, right? Now, pollen can be windblown or it can be carried by insects, right? So the evolution of insects, right? This is actually called coevolution because it was good for the insects because the insects got food from whoever, they're getting nectar from whatever plant, right? And the plant's evolving because they have a way to get pollen from one place to another. So this is when you're gonna transition now into, into other plants as well. So now let's move into the Mesozoic era. Mesozoic era is in the middle. So what are we starting with at the beginning of the Mesozoic era? What are we starting with? We're starting with early reptiles. And what are we starting with? Gymnosperms. And we're going to make some transitions now. Now, the Mesozoic era is broken into three periods. The middle period is the name of a movie you know called Jurassic, Jurassic Park. The Jurassic period is when dinosaurs flourished. 
So they're gaining ascendancy. They then by the Jurassic period they have they're dominating, and then they're starting to decline by the end of your Mesozoic era. So what kinds of organisms are you seeing here? You're starting to see the development of cycads. You're getting um, more evolved in your angiosperms and your monocots. And then you're starting to see these creatures called therapsids. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're getting these different creatures evolving. Um, you, there's m all kinds of movies about these time periods. You remember this one? Okay, but you're starting to now get the evolution of flowering. Um, yeah, Miss Fowler uses this all the time, this cartoon. I know, and I'm like, I use it first. Um, but these flowering plants, um, you're starting to see evolve. So. Um, and you're getting these early mammals. Now the first mammals were very, very small, rodent-like creatures that are burrowing underground. Remember how I told you there are mass extinctions? Mm -hmm. So think about this. Why, or, oh no, that, did I talk about that in this class yet? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did, right? Yeah, it's yeah. all overlapping in my head. What are some things that could have caused mass extinctions on Earth? Any ideas? Meteorites, Meteorites is one that you know about. What else? A plague, okay. Volcano. Volcano, what else? Natural movement. Movement of, and you could have had any, you know, about ice ages, uh, right, global happening, uh, global yeah. warming, right? We just like to facilitate that process now with the gases that we get out there, as, as long as you still are, you know, in, you know, am I allowed to teach that? And um, <laughs> these early mammals, if there was a giant, why, why would dinosaurs be killed by a comet? It impacts the earth. Is it like, oh, you shook me off and I fell over? It's like, oh, and I can't get up. <laughs> My little hand. Why? Dust in the atmosphere. Good. Okay. So if you're a large herbivore, and if you're not an herbivore, you might be a who eats large herbivores. Right. You're very dependent on plants. But now you have the sun, so the plants die. Who might be underground and could survive that? Little what? Mammals. Mammals. Okay? Then they could come out and eat your dead bodies. All right? So early mammals might have survived and flourished because now when they come above ground, nobody's eating them. Okay? So maybe that's why they gained ascendancy. So on your note, go to, um, where are we at? Mesozoic era? Yeah. So you already know you started with gymnosperms and early reptiles. Now we're going to early angiosperms. A-N-G-I-O. <coughs> early angiosperms and early mammals is where you end. Early angiosperms and early mammals. Remember him? <laughs> Okay, so now let's move into our Cenozoic era. Cenozoic era is the era you're in now. When did it start? 65 million years ago. So now we have early mammals. Is this an early mammal? No. I mean, he's evolved quite a bit. He's not a small little rodent. He's a very large creature, right? So that we're starting the Cenozoic era 65 million years ago over time, then you would select, you would radiate out into these different environments. Um, and so here would be like this uh, woolly mammoth. Um, here are some other organisms you might see. Okay, and then you might eventually get primates and then all the way up to man. So what I want you to put here on Cenozoic era, I put herbs, this is not like pot, okay? <laughs> herbs, which is more evolved angiosperms and humans. Like Though both. easy to remember because it's legal now and you can put those two together. Herbs and humans, of course, okay? Look for the little green crosses. It seems to me we skipped a question somewhere in here. It's right here. Yeah, I skipped a question in here. Um, I need to remove some students, so hang on. Let's log in at Let's log in is your favorite summertime, summertime activity. It's not summer. I can see summer. I can start to smell summer. 
Can you? I can. You're going to be juniors. You can go off campus. Make good choices. What? You spell it wrong too. <laughs> Let's flip lap. You did terms. Did you remember how to do it? Yeah. We should I'm starting the ballet in Okay, check with your bio buddies, see if they got it. More than likely, they got it right. Give them a high five. Somebody struggled. Somebody struggled. Put it in your bio. I think you're trying to hide five feet. All right, and here we go. I, I don't know if this is a good question or not, because I couldn't check it, but we'll see. How could you do that? I couldn't check it because I didn't have access to notebook over the weekend. My license is expired. What? All right. It's another whole story. I put in weeks ago. It looks like they're going to expire. It looks like they're, they're like, no, no, we fixed it. And then I, because you can have notebook at home too, you know, when you're a teacher, because it's a paid for service, you know. And I was at home, and on the weekend, it's like it expired. I couldn't get any, anything. It was very, and then I forgot to check out the notebook. But how could you do it here, but not here? Two different computers. Um, My home computer, I have them linked, like I can access different things, but I couldn't pull up the software notebook. Six questions, ready? I better pause this, that's six. Okay, here we go. Let's see how you did. Oh, dinosaurs were dominant, Mesozoic, everybody but one got that. They said Paleozoic. No. Did we have any dinosaurs during the Paleozoic era? No. When the Paleozoic era ended, you had early reptiles, okay? 570 to 245, what's that? Paleozoic, good job. Three people said Mesozoic. Mesozoic would be like 245 to how long? 65. Check your bio buddies. Slide. Did they do okay? Do they need support? Are you giving them a gong of victory or a shame bell? <laughs> Algae to gymnosperms, fish, amphibians, reptiles. Yes, that is Paleozoic. Some of you really struggled. Check your bio buddy right now. Because you have notes in front of you, you shouldn't miss this. Name the era. Reptiles to early mammals. That's Mesozoic. A couple of you missed that one. Oh, good job. You got that right. Hundy. One. Two. Two hundies. Yeah, okay. Three, four. We're at two. Twenty-five. Yeah. Do they really have twenty-eight? Fifty-seven. No, no, that's what slide I am in their presentation. This is how many um, hundies you have on the left. Oh, they got eight. Oh, yeah, sorry. seventh period support, one time age bio students in here. Yeah. All right. So now um, we're doing great. Okay, we're getting close here to the end. Biogeographical evidence is our next piece. And I'm going to let Slate explain this one because we've already talked about it at least three different times. Go ahead, Slated person. So, Okay, 
Okay, checking your notes. Come back to me. Biogeographical evidence. Provide evidence that variability, you're still talking? Variability in single ancestral population can lead to adaptation to different environments. Adaptations to different environments through the forces of natural selection can lead to adaptation to different environments through the forces of natural selection. Dash, driven by competition. Driven by competition. Did I give you all that or did I not? It's a question I'm asking. No, you had to type it, right? Yeah. Okay. Adaptation to different environments through the forces of natural selection driven by competition. Examples, when continents were joined, there were similar species, but after separated, more continent-specific species, like what's something you can find in Alaska that, or Alaska, turn it, Australia, that is um, a mammal. Good, what are those called? Marsupials. Marsupials, write that down, marsupials. All right, next piece, I have actually already explained this to you, so this will be, this will be a little bit of review. So there are three pieces of anatomical evidence. Homologous structure is this first one. If you have common anatomy, then you probably have common DNA and a common ancestor. Now, I need to distinguish, because people do this on tests all the time, so I want to make sure you get this right. Homologous structures are evidence of evidence, or evidence of evolution. Analogous structures are not. Analogous structures are about function. For instance, for instance uh, butterflies have wings, bees have wings, birds have wings, bats have wings. They all do what? Fly. That does not mean they're related. They just handle their environment in the same way by having wings. There are many different creatures that swim in the water and have fins, like a whale is in the water, but a whale is like us, it is a what? Mammal. But a fish also has fins and it swims. Those are analogous structures. Those are not pieces of evidence for evolution. Those are just, I handle my environment in the same way. You walk on legs, an insect has legs, it doesn't mean that you are related, closely, closely related to an insect, right? You're just handling your environment in the same way. So make sure homologous means same structure. Okay? So I would like Slated BioBuddy to explain that using this right here. Go ahead, Slated BioBuddy. Slated BioBuddy. Oh. Okay, now on your notes, guys, on your notes, biogeographical evidence, or sorry, anatomical evidence, homologous structures have similar anatomy but may have different functions. <laughs> similar anatomy but may have different functions. Similar anatomy, but may have different functions. Okay, next thing I wanna to talk to you about, vestigial structures. Remember those salamanders I talked to you about living in caves? Mm -hmm. So here they have like vestigial eyes, remnants of eyes. You have an appendix, why? And it could be a remnant of housing bacteria because what's one thing we have a hard time digesting because we don't have any enzymes for it? Yeah, fiber, plant material. Maybe it would house bacteria to help us digest plant material. However, that's really late in the game digestion-wise because the bulk of digestion is completed and absorption by the time you get in your small intestines. So, but that's possibly what it could be used for. Um, you look at whales, they have part of a femur, this bone, and part of their pelvis. What does that tell you? That whales could have been organisms that lived on land, mammals that were on land, and then slowly migrated into the water. Because they certainly don't walk now, and they don't even have any hind limbs that you can even see. But they have remnants of a pelvis. 
Did God create them with a little withered pelvis and a little withered femur? Or is it possible they walked on land and then moved back into the water? Okay, so that's a, your second piece of anatomical evidence. Your first one is homologous. Your second one is vestigial structures. So on your notes, vestigial structures, anatomy traces um, evolutionary history. And the last one is embryological development. You can look at similar embryos. So this is working from left to right, fish, salamander, tortoise, chick, human. And you can look at the more similar, the maybe the more closely related, and it also kind of looks like evolution on fast forward. All right, and then this brings us to our last and, and really most important um, classification um, or used, and that is um, biochemical. So in biochemical evidence, you're either going to compare things like DNA or you're going to compare proteins and the sequence of amino acids and proteins or the sequence of nucleotides in DNA. And the assumption is the more closely related, the more similar those DNA and proteins would be. So underneath biochemical, biochemical evidence, almost all living organisms use ATP, DNA, and specific enzymes. Use ATP, DNA, and specific enzymes. The more similar the DNA, the more similar the DNA slash proteins, the more closely related. The more similar the DNA, the more closely related. Okay, so when you compare like a chimp, a gorilla, or an orangutan, um, you can see the greater the number of shared DNA sequences between the species, the greater the number of shared genes, and therefore the greater evidence that there is a common ancestor. Here, okay, um, when you look at the molecular clock, it's looking at the rate of mutations. And mutations tend to happen at a, st at a standard rate and so when you look at differences between organisms, you compare how many mutational differences they have, and you can use that as a way of keeping time of how long it has been since they shared a common ancestor. So if you and I have greater, well, we're the same species, so that doesn't count, but if you analyze two different species and they have a, uh, several divergences due to mutations, then they probably had a common ancestor a long time ago, but if you only have a few mutational differences, you probably have a more recent common ancestor. And then you can kind of sequence them out of who evolved first and who evolved second. So on your notes where it says biochemical evidence, molecular clocks, it uses comparisons of DNA sequences to estimate phylogeny and the rate of evolution. And the rate of evolution. The differences of genes indicates the presence of mutations. The more mutational differences, the more time has passed. The more mutational differences, the more time has passed. Okay, and this is going to lead you up to your pogo you're going to be doing on Monday. And I'm not here, so I want to show you this as an introduction. So. Um, when you classify organisms, one way to do it is to represent it in what's called a cladogram. It's just a visualization of who evolved first, second, and third. So in order to do that, to look at that evolutionary history, you use something called systematics as you're just studying the organisms, you're looking at these molecular clocks in order to determine their phylogeny. Could Blue tell them what the phylogeny is? Go ahead, Blue. <laughs> Slate, this is called a cladogram. Okay? 
So Slate, could you please explain, what do you see? What's this pattern in this cladogram? How are they setting up these organisms? Look at the changes, the notches. Go ahead, Slate, see if you can figure it out. All right, so this line right here says jaws. So that means everybody from here up has what? Jaws. Okay, everybody from here up has lungs. Since all of these guys have lungs and the perch doesn't, we drop him off. Right? So the chimp evolved away from the perch. This is the last time, okay, that they shared. Here's the perch right here. This is the last time they shared a common ancestor. Okay, from here up, everybody has what? Claws, Claws and nails. But the salamander doesn't. So for the chimp, this is the last time the chimp and the salamander shared a common ancestor. But from here up, and here's a problem with birds. Birds are a big problem. Because birds are, they're actually their own class, aves, but they really shouldn't be. When you look at their traits, they really should be part, does anybody know? Reptiles. Yeah, they really should be thrown in with reptiles, but we've given their own distinction through just historical classification, so people have a hard time not throwing them in with reptiles. From here up, everybody has fur and mammary glands. And then a mouse and a chimp, can you think of differences between a mouse and a chimp? Yeah, like a prehensile tail or other things that you can do, or a digit, a thumb, opposable thumbs. So here is the last time they shared a common ancestor. So what a cladogram does is it helps you visualize evolutionary history. And when you go do your um, Ed Puzzle, that seven minute one, you're gonna look and talk about how cladograms are set up. And when you, when I'm not here on Monday, you're gonna talk about phylogenetic trees and some of the biomolecular things you look at in order to set them up. On your notes, I want you to put this in here under phylogenetics. It's a modern way in which organisms are classified. And then go down into cladogram. Put it reflects the evolutionary history slash relationships. Reflects the evolutionary history slash relationships. Okay, be good, make good choices. I'll see you at the review on Tuesday. Wait, you missed one. I know. Okay.